Uh, good evening, everybody. I do not take for granted that you are here tonight, given the weather that happened just before this talk. So thank you for making it out here. And thank you for Susan and the Shaw Institute for having me back. I've been coming to the Shaw Institute to these same lectures since I was 15 back in 2008. And so it's an honor to be up here. And I'm so grateful for the leadership of the Shaw Institute, not only in studying the problems that our world faces, but also taking action. Uh, so thank you for that decades long work. Doing good, not just less harm. This is a notion that I've been exposed to over the past five years. Thank you. As I've been introduced to the field of biomimicry uh, and other schools of thought within sustainability. And I thought that I would start off with this title because so much of our conversation focuses on reducing the negative and not necessarily thinking about how we can be part of the positive. I hope that by the end of today's talk, that we might have a better sense of how we might be part of the solution and address the challenges that we're facing. I'll begin with some new stories, but old news to all of this. And hopefully this is the least informative slide of the whole presentation. These were the headlines from just one week's uh, worth of emails coming into my inbox. They should be familiar to you even if the headlines, uh, the specifics are unique. Rather than focusing on any particular problem in this talk, I want to explore with you a little bit what brought us here and what might we do going forward. The way that I think about it is that the way that we operate as a species is a threat to our own existence. We are compromising the life support systems of the planet upon which we depend so much. Some of you might be familiar with the term ecosystem services. It's a, it's a term that was coined by economists and ecologists to talk about all the services that we receive from nature that enable our survival. It might be things like clean water and soil, uh, raw materials, uh, food, and even the spiritual uh, and aesthetic uh, benefit that we get from nature. I like to put this slide up because for me, it's a shorthand to talk about all the different ways that we are interdependent with the natural world and depend on it for our own survival. And the way that we make and do things is compromising these support systems. The way that we do chemistry, the way that we create packaging and materials, the way that we manufacture, the way that we generate energy. These are the consequences of a mindset uh, in a system that creates through heating beating and treating, and also a linear economy that takes, makes, and breaks. And it all falls under the ideology that the resources that we can get from nature are boundless, and the source or the sink to which we can put our waste is limitless, both of which are false notions. And so we are seeking a better future, and these are just three initiatives that are leading the way in uh, imagining what a future that sustains us and the rest of the world might look like. Green chemistry challenges the notion that chemistry is somehow inherently hazardous, suggesting ways that we can manufacture chemistry in benign ways um, that use less energy and um, less harmful materials. The circular economy challenges that linear economy and says that we can take our biological and technical materials and put them into loops so we can retain the value and perpetuate safe materials. And of course, the existential crisis that we're facing is climate change. Uh, and Project Drawdown has identified 100 most popular or most feasible strategies to draw down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and stop emitting it in the first place. The question that I ask is, how do we solve these specific problems? And although this brother from another mother might be asking the question, uh, it's really on us to answer uh, it for ourselves. A long, long time ago, I wanted to be a designer, an industrial designer, uh, and to design and the, the solutions to the challenges that we were facing. And as I was taking this course out in California, we had an opportunity to tour a design studio in San Francisco. And I got the chance to ask our tour guide, who was also a designer there, what's your first step uh, in addressing a challenge? Now, at the time, I expected him to say that he pulls out the paper and starts to draw and brainstorm. But his answer surprised me. He said that he goes and sees what others have done. It might be in a trade magazine. It might be just going to shops out on the street. But to start to feed off of the creativity of others. 
The thing that I'd like to introduce to us is the idea that we may not want to limit ourselves to human creativity. Nature does chemistry. Nature creates packaging. Nature manufactures materials. Nature generates energy. Biomimicry is the promise that we can look to these biological models for inspiration to influence the way that we make and do things. It is the conscious emulation of nature's genius. Conscious because we're being deliberate about it. Emulation because we're not just taking the things from nature, we're learning from the design principles that underline, underlie how they function. And nature's genius because it's incredible what the natural world has accomplished that we also seek to do. The premise is simple. We're adapting to the same biotic and abiotic uh, selection pressures, the same operating conditions, whether we're living in a desert and have to manage for high heat, or in the cold of Minnesota where I am now, where you must stay warm in the dreadful winters. We are trying to adapt to the same world that these organisms have been adapting to for 3.8 billion years. And they have been doing so in alignment with Earth's limits and boundaries and under a rigorous selection pressure to be better than their neighbor. We talk about it as being an emerging practice of an ancient, an emerging discipline of an ancient practice. Because we have been looking to the natural world for inspiration for as long as we have been a species. It's no accident that armor looks like fish scales, that baskets and nets look like spider webs. Barbed wire, we know, was designed based off of uh, thorns. And Leonardo da Vinci is famous for looking to the natural world for inspiration. He would go into the Milan marketplace and buy pigeons and bring them home, releasing them to watch them fly. Asking the question, if I can understand how these birds fly, could I fly myself? We talk a lot about innovation, and I wanted to put this slide up here to say that it's more than just talk. A study by Julian Vincent and Al in 1993 looked at the human uh, problem-solving space and searched uh, patent databases to see what were the themes that emerged for solving different kind of problems, problems like to be strong but lightweight. And then they did a comparison to this problem solving that nature does. And they thought that perhaps we've already invented uh, the same things that nature has come upon, that it's kind of a convergence. And yet, there is only a 12% overlap between the two. That means that 88% of the time, we're going to be surprised when we look to how nature solves a problem. Another reason we want to look to nature is because it performs better and is more sustainable uh, than the way we do things conventionally. I think the greatest example to talk about here is comparing Kevlar, one of our strongest materials, and spider silk. Spider silk is five times stronger and three times tougher than Kevlar, and yet the way it is made is drastically different. Kevlar is petroleum that's boiled at 700 degrees centigrade uh, in sulfuric, sulfuric acid at that temperature, whereas spider silk is made out of water and bugs in the corner of your bedroom. <laughs> Which factory would you want to live next to? So the idea of biomimicry is that we can broaden the idea space beyond the human uh, creative space into this catalog of ideas provided by nature. Some of the best ways to convey what the, the potential of biomimicry is to start talking about case studies. And I'm glad that I have some extra time this year to share with you a couple different ones. The first one I want to start with is uh, a case study with whales, one of my favorite. The story begins with a researcher, somewhat ironically named Fat, uh, Frank Fish, who was shopping with his wife on a New England holiday and came into the store and saw a statue not too different from this one. And being an engineer, he was taught that you, if you have a foil moving through water, like an airplane wing or a fan blade, you want it to be as smooth as possible. So when he looked at the whale statue, he said out loud, the artist put the bumps on the wrong side. Luckily for us and for him, he was overheard by the shop owner who said, no, no, the artist is authentic to the biology. And this started a curiosity for Frank Fish, because why would evolution select for something that was clearly wrong? We need to understand something about whale behavior to understand why they might have bumps on their, the leading edge of their flippers. Unlike other whales that chase down their prey, 
humpback whales herd their prey. They start low in the water column and start coming up in a spiral, releasing bubbles out of their blowhole, forming a bubble net. And as they get closer to the surface, they become tighter and tighter until at the very end, they do a somersault and come through the middle eating their lunch. You have to remember that this is something the size of a school bus and to do a backflip is not easy in the water. So how is it so agile? Well, Frank Fish joined up with biologists and engineers and physicists and started to look at whether or not these tubercles, as they're called, have something to do with the efficiency of the whale in water. And what they found is that the bumps channel water over them at an accelerated rate, as you can see here on the left with the, the green flows. And what that means is that as, I can use my, my shadow, as air goes over the foil on with the tubercles, it's able to stick. And so there's an increase in laminar flow. And turbulence is decreased. You can think about it this way. When a plane is going into an ascent, if it goes too steep, it's going to stall because, and it's going to lose lift because it starts to get turbulence on the top and it no longer has that lift. What this allows is for angles of attack that are steeper, more lift is generated and drag is reduced. So Frank Fish started a business and he created tube whale power uh, with tubercle technology. And he started to think about what human artifacts move through fluid the way a whale flipper does. Well, one obvious thing was a wind turbine blade. And this is what's pictured here with tubercles on the leading edge. Now there's two facts that I like to share about this story. One is that by adding the tubercles to the leading edge here, the amount of power that's generated from the same wind speed is increased by 20%. What I find more exciting is that the wind turbine blades will continue to rotate at lower wind speeds if they have tubercle technology. This is significant because there's many places where we'd like to put wind turbines, but the wind speeds aren't fast enough for conventional turbines. But how would this open up that space? And there's actually another very exciting thing. If I go back here, you can see that there's this reverse flow at the wing tip, at the foil tip, without the tubercles, which just means that the pressure that's building up here spills over. And that causes vibration at the end of your blade, a fan blade, a wind turbine. That's what creates noise pollution from a wind farm. Tubercles eliminate that. And these wind turbines are quieter than conventional ones as well. Wind turbine blades aren't the only ones, only things that move through fluid. Fans are just the inverse. Rather than collecting energy, they're using energy to move air. And so this technology is applicable uh, to this uh, setting as well. These are industrial sized fans. They are in warehouses moving huge volumes of air. And by adding tubercles to their leading edge, they were able to decrease the motor size, use fewer blades, move more air with less energy. It's quite powerful, and this is also being applied to computer fan blades and server fans, which have a high demand on cooling. How can we make this less than just accidental? How can we be deliberate, conscious, in our attempt to emulate nature? Biology and human challenges can seem very different. What does a whale have to do with a wind turbine blade? We can bridge these two worlds through the language of function. It's asking the question in a slightly different way. So rather than asking how would nature make a wind turbine or a fan blade, we might start to ask questions like how do we reduce drag while moving through a fluid? The fan blade and the whale flipper is doing the same thing. Before I share with you a few more case studies, I want to couch them in one of the challenges that we're facing, which is an increase in urbanization. By 2050, 65% of the world is going to be urban, which means that we need to build a lot more cities. And as we build cities, we need to be mindful of our impact. So how can biomimicry contribute uh, to reducing the negative impact that we might have on the world through building cities? Now, one thing that I see when I look at this picture is lots of light. And light is energy consumption. So why don't we try this out? Why don't we go to nature and say, how does nature make a light bulb? might not work too well. It's a bit of a nonsensical question. But let's apply that functional lens and say, instead of how does nature make a light bulb, how does nature manipulate light? How does nature generate light? Well, suddenly, we have tons of examples that we might turn to. And the firefly is one of them. 
Now we might want to look at how the light is generated, but in this case, I want to think about how a very small, weak light source is transmitted over super long distances, all in the interest of getting some. If we look closely at the abdomen of a firefly, we see that it isn't smooth. It has this shingle-like appearance. And if we will look even closer, we see that each one of those shingles has this grooved surface. Might this help the firefly be efficient in broadcasting its light? Well, indeed it does. This is a mock-up of the firefly, which shows that with those ridges and with those tiles, more light is transmitted out. If we think about an LED, there's two constraints that we want to be working with. One is how much light is generated by the diode. And that's been pretty optimized. There's not much work there. But the place where a lot of people are trying to improve efficiency is how much of that light actually gets out, because much of it is reflected back in. The firefly's design prevents internal refraction, increasing the amount of light that's able to leave by 50%. So you can have twice as bright a light with the same amount of energy, or use half the amount of energy to have the same uh, brightness. And this is a thin film that was created for LEDs to increase this efficiency. The interesting thing is that then when they first did these tests back in, I think, 2012, they used these very symmetric uh, rig uh, uh, shingles. Upon closer examination, they realized that they were slanted in the firefly. And when they change just that orientation, they increase the amount of light emitted by another 90%. Pays to pay attention. So what else do we see in these cities? A lot of windows. And as you might know, windows cause problems for wildlife. There are between 100 million to a billion bird strikes a year, depending on what sources you look at. Regardless, it's a huge number of senseless deaths of birds, especially migratory birds who are under particular threat how does nature deter bird strikes? Well, if you were a spider and you were trying to catch a small meal and a bird flew through your net, you'd have to build another one. And that's a lot of energy use and material use that's wasted. So orb weavers, which are the class of spiders that are known for their classical Halloween spokes uh, and rings, build big nets in clear spaces that birds are likely to fly through. However, they weave in a fiber that's UV reflective. And birds, unlike us, can see UV light. So it's essentially a signal to say, occupied, don't fly through here. There is a lawyer in Germany who was reading this in a, in a nature journal of sorts. And he was, drew the connection between bird strikes in a spider web and bird strikes in a window. And so he went over to a friend of his who happened to work at Arnold Glass. And he said, you have to do something. So after a lot of research and a lot of thinking, Arnold Glass developed a product known as Ornolux, which has what's visible to birds, but is not visible to humans. And under test, this reduces bird strikes by 70%. Two more things that are connected. Materials, building buildings. We use a lot of wood in construction, and not just in building construction, but also in furniture construction. However, 10% of the weight of something like plywood is adhesive, specifically formaldehyde. And that is something that causes health consequences, not only when it off-gasses within our use, but also in the manufacturing process. If we look through the lens of function, what we're trying to do is to adhere different pieces of wood together. There was a scientist who was working in this space, and he, he's based in Oregon, and he was tide pulling and he was collecting mussels for dinner. And he realized that these mussels are able to stick to the rocks in a really turbulent zone, the intertidal zone, and not be swept away. And not only that, but their adhesive cures underwater, which is something that no man-made, human-made adhesive is capable of doing. So his team started to research these marine adhesive proteins to see what they might learn and whether or not they might apply it uh, to the wood industry. And indeed, it led to a product called Pure Bond, which was uh, taken up by Columbia Forest Products. And they've created a plywood that is formaldehyde-free. 
And they're not going out and harvesting mussels and taking out the adhesive. They've studied the chemical structure of that adhesive, and they've used soybeans to, uh, as, as the feedstock. So they're even getting away from fossil fuels. Finally, when we can't build with wood, we build with concrete. And concrete is one of the greatest offenders uh, in terms of climate change. It accounts for about 5 to 8% of global carbon dioxide emissions. And it is the second most used resource after water in the world, accounting for much mining. And actually, if you read um, uh, a shortage of sand, because they use a particular kind of sand in their construction. Well, if we think about how we might look to nature to uh, build our buildings, this is what nature's construction site looks like. And it's not that different from the last one, because both of them are using calcium carbonate as, uh, to build their, their homes. Instead of taking limestone and baking it, uh, you, which uses high inputs of energy and releases CO2, about one ton of CO2 for every ton of concrete produced, this actually sequesters CO2 uh, through calcium carbonate. There's a company called Calera that's done exactly this. It takes off CO2 emissions from manufacturing or power generation, precipitates out through a low energy, low pressure uh, process, calcium carbonate cement, and we now have a carbon uh, negative concrete. I chose these examples to pair with these initiatives, green chemistry and muscle adhesives, project drawdown and drawing down CO2, whether through soybean use feedstocks or through uh, calcium carbonate taking CO2 out of the air. And both of those examples also feeding in to the closed uh, loop nature of the circular economy. I see biomimicry as uh, providing answers where the rubber meets the road in many of these initiatives. One question that we must ask ourselves is can we do the right thing but in the wrong way? If we were to design an LED light bulb that was inspired by the firefly, but we were to make it out of heavy metals and ship it around the world using uh, crude petroleum, are we really accomplishing our ultimate goal of fitting into the ecological context of the planet? What I find, uh, and an example of is, would also be spider silk. Many people are looking at emulating the strength of spider silk, but unless we do it in the same way that the spider does it, we won't succeed. And what I find exciting about biomimicry is that it provides both not also not just what we want to do, but also how we should be doing it in order to achieve that sustainability goal. We see cities as these consumptive entities that take in resources and generate waste. What if by applying some of these strategies, not in isolation but together, we change that? What if we had generous cities whose net impact was positive? What if we paid attention to how much our infrastructure sequestered CO2, collected in purified water, supported biomass and biodiversity, even considering the solar gain of our environments and managing the urban heat island effect? Can we look to the ecosystems around us for the performance standards by which we should perform? The question is, can our cities perform like ecosystems? Janine Binyas, who's one of the leaders in this field, talks of a vision where we know that we will achieve sustainability when what we do functions like the natural world. Could we fly over a forest and then over the city, and although it might look very different, could it be functioning in the same way? This is part of becoming part of the natural world and not being separate from it. The ecosystem services that we spoke about earlier. I am inspired by biomimicry because it not only provides the aspirational goal of where we want to go, but also provides the stepping stones uh, for how to get there. I would be amiss, though, if I left you with that. I do not think that we will be able to solve the challenges we face if we do not shift the underlying mindset with which we operate. How we view the world shapes our impact. And right now, we are severed from the natural world and lack a connection. 
It's hard living in the places we live to realize how interdependent we are on all those services that are provided for free from the natural world. Connection not only inspires, sorry, I drew a blank there. Connection uh, inspires responsibility in us to be accountable for the actions uh, that we take. And I'd like to, as I near the end, I'd like to put up a quote by David Suzuki, the environmentalist and scientist, who points out that throughout history, the history of our species, human beings have understood that we are a part of nature in which everything is connected to everything else and nothing exists in isolation. So every deliberate act carries the responsibility to think beyond the immediate issue and consider the whole system. And so my call is to say that we need to increase our connection to nature so that we can increase our sense of responsibility and accountability to ourselves and the rest of life. And I end tonight with a quote from another mentor, Janine Binyas, who once put out the call to my biomimicry cohort to make us realize that any part of the earth that we touch, we can heal. And so I am highly encouraged to realize that there are so many places to intervene uh, in this system that are within reach of us as individuals. And I'd like to put out the ask to you to consider what parts of the earth you touch how you might heal it, and how nature might serve as a model, a measure, or a mentor in that work. Thank you very much.